Namaskar, Nathan. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Thank you. I'm delighted to be part of the Ahimsa Conversations. Lovely. Uh, so, Nathan, you have been associated with the nonviolent studies, uh, I think, from your student days. Can you maybe start by saying something about that uh, history of your own involvement and your interest in this ideal? Yes, well, my student days have something to do with my earliest involvement. I did study with uh, Jean Sharp in graduate school and also with uh, Diana Eck on Gandhi specifically, but I grew up in a, um, a pacifist uh, conservative Mennonite farming community. So it was in the air we breathed, it was assumed. It was of course, uh, partly because of the separation from the state that uh, you know that 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 this uh, community formed its own school, and so this was a um, <clears throat> a school of ten grades enough to meet the legal requirements for education and to get people back on the farm, uh, but you know it was just the air uh, we breathed, uh, the separatism first of all, the the, the sense that we were different, and uh, I I left that I uh, without. Uh, well, I can say that, uh, you know, it came to mind specifically when my father took his three sons and uh, when the Vietnam War was beginning in 64, 65, and, and gravely talked about the possibilities of uh, being drafted and how we would not be doing that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, later he supplied us with forms for uh, being uh, conscientious objectors uh, certainly, uh, I, 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 I have, uh, starting with student days, uh, not uh, hewn to the pacifist form, uh, but rather uh, of, uh, you know, the, uh, the absolute principled uh, pacifism, but rather uh, I've been very interested in uh, strategic and certainly if possible coercive forms of, of nonviolence and uh, uh, all the ways that uh, power and influence can be exercised without uh, you know coming out of the barrel of a gun. So uh, I, I, uh, be, I, so what remained from that pacifist background was a, was an interest in violence, political violence, and certainly protest and and nonconformity, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and ways of exercising power uh, other than violence. So I, um, I I started to study that as soon as I was in graduate school. I. I, I remember, uh, uh, you know, studying that in uh, a class on Jewish ethics. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, uh, with Jean Sharp, whose institute I was part of, and also with uh, uh, Professor Joseph Nye at the Kennedy School. Uh, in our course on ethics, I was uh, writing on. Uh, uh, on the possibilities of nonviolence and uh, and even also, uh, you know, principled nonviolence. What would happen, for example, if uh, if uh, persons who were uh, not in favor of, of violence would object to uh, someone saving their life uh, out of uh, the sense that they had to intervene? Things like that. So uh, it's been uh, a part of my uh, my past and my present, although taking different forms. Yeah, great. Um, you are, we'll talk about Rosenstrasse in a bit, but I was wondering if uh, before we get into that specific story, you would like to walk us through uh, the many ways in which nonviolence did feature in the Nazi period, whether it is the Danish story, or I think it is the Norwegian teachers, right, who refused. Yes. Uh, so maybe uh, because a lot of people uh, uh, tend to believe, even well-informed people tend to believe that nonviolence was not on the scene at all mm -hmm. in that dark period. So could you please give us a kind of a brief history of that? 
Well, first of all, you mentioned these Northern European uh, non-cooperation, non-compliance and resistance tradition. And uh, that the, the Nazi racial uh, ideology is key here already. Certainly in Poland, uh, in Russia, uh, those kinds of uh, actions would have been, uh, you know, much more likely to be crushed much more ruthlessly. The, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so, you know, this has to be applied, what I'm saying in the historical context. And the second element of this historical context is that Hitler was actually um, quite attuned to the powers of, of collectivity. And he recognizes in his book, Mein Kampf, that uh, you know, trade unions and collective actions can uh, cripple an economy and, uh, and, and the state. And uh, so he's not like, uh, like many of the portraits of Hitler are that he's this raving madman without any possibility of strategy. Now, this is really getting into uh, very quickly into contested territory. And I just want to say that's my interpretation. But if you read Mein Kampf, you see how critical to him mass movement, mass followership is. And, and, and you observe that in light of his dictatorship, you see how important his image was yes. for people not outside the Reich, but within the Reich. Uh, people of his race, he really wanted to be liked and adored and followed as a Fuhrer. That's really the final bottom line. He wanted to be followed as the leader. He wanted people to learn to trust him uh, and to become uh, Nazis. Uh, even if nobody was looking, they would be acting like Nazis. And, uh, and so this is only, again, uh, you know, within the Reich, among people he considered uh, to be Germans, that he was concerned about actually, actually uh, uh, molding, sculpting their behavior and their attitudes. And so within Germany, if you were so-called Aryan or a German race, in his opinion, you had more possibility for uh, for expressing dissent. Now, of course, you had less possibility if you had a record as being a communist. Uh, you were not given as many, uh, you know, many opportunities uh, to to dissent. But within uh, <clears throat> Germany itself, that said, um, there you know, there, there were enough protests, few as they were, so that in early November 1943, Joseph Goebbels writes in his diary that, uh, unfortunately, the state has been giving into the streets and uh, the people have become aware of how to use this power of protest on the streets and, uh, and, and the regime dare not give in uh, to this uh, because uh, each time it gives in, it loses a little bit of its authority until in the end, it doesn't have any authority. Now, uh, this came after, uh, you know, a series of, uh, of, of, of protests and, and uh, various forms of dissent, uh, most notably already in the mid thirties, uh, uh, a handful of very notable protests from Catholics against the removal of crucifixes from the Catholic schools, which were also in Germany at the time, public schools, uh, but, but under Catholic supervision administration. So uh, the Nazis set about trying to secularize them by removing uh, religious instructions and above all the crucifix, that uh, very venerable symbol of Christianity for Catholics. Uh, and uh, of course, there was also these this public unrest and public rumors are also related in the Nazi lexicon to uh, resistance. Anything that uh, would get in the way of their ability to totally form opinion, uh, of course, like listening to foreign radios, but also anything that showed dissent really worked against uh, that uh, kind of uh, very powerful uh, opinion that everybody 
was on board with Hitler, except there were always, you needed one or two presenters, some outside friends, enemies of the state, there were those, but all the rest of us are united and there are these people trying to uh, uh, do something uh, against us. So uh, we have uh, von Gallen who uh, protested the euthanasia, but uh, his power is not, in my opinion, as is often understood, based on his office as a bishop, but only on the fact that he had these millions of Germans uh, who uh, considered him a hero. And uh, so his power was firmly uh, based in, in popular will, popular opinion, and nothing to do with uh, coercive violence. Then, of course, in 1943, and there are other uh, things I could talk about there. Uh, when the war started, uh, the military, uh, before the war started, Germans on the Western side of uh, Germany, uh, fearing that France would invade uh, when war started, they started moving on their own accord and, and moving inland, staying with relatives. And uh, the army you know, pleaded with Hitler to order a stop to that. Uh, but uh, but he wouldn't, I think, uh, probably because he thought that would uh, maybe uh, test his authority. And he didn't want that to be publicly shown uh, to be in uh, ineffective. So uh, there was uh, was that, of course, in 43, uh, there were further crucifix decrees in 41 in Bavaria, uh, very important. Uh, but also in 43, before Goebbels wrote this, uh, in early 1943, uh, there was the Rosenstrasse protest of women on the streets. Uh, a few months later, according to the SD, there was uh, an uprising in a suburb of, uh, of Dortmund, uh, Herde, where, um, uh, where, where uh, a crowd spontaneously took the side of a, a man who the Gestapo was was harassing and going to arrest, and the Gestapo fled. Uh, and according to the to the SD secret police reports, they used the same phrase that the women on Rosenstrasse were using: uh, "We want our men back," or "We want our husbands back." Uh, can be translated either way in German. So it shows that the rumors about the uh, protest in Rosenstrasse and the success of it must have been uh, coursing around Germany. Uh, and this is what Goebbels is saying. And I think it's November the 3rd, 1943, when he writes that uh, the people have learned where our flexible spot is. And if they push on that, we're pliable, is the way he puts it. The Rosenstrasse protest is uh, your uh, major work. It's I think you've written the most authoritative book on that. Can you, uh, most people who will listen to this have not heard about that protest ever before. So can you just walk us through exactly what happened? What, uh, what was, how did it start? And then what was it about? Thank you. Okay, well, it's complicated because uh, the Jews who were imprisoned there at Rosenstrasse were Jews, which the regime considered full Jews. That is, there was no question about their fate. There were uh, persons who the regime called half Jews, and then uh, it divided these half Jews into categories. Uh, one category was called the counted as a Jew, Geltum Judah, and those were, of course, vulnerable to all the persecutions of full Jews. Uh, but it turned out that uh, the intermarried couples, that is the non-Jewish partners of the Jewish victims, the ones that uh, the full Jews that the Nazis wanted to uh, victimize and murder, that they did not divorce as quickly and readily as the Nazis had planned. And uh, that really is the key here. The key resistance here actually is uh, refusing to divorce and all that went with it. So refusing to divorce, the Nazis made sure they applied pressures to these non-Jewish uh, partners of the German Jews in ways uh, that uh, they expected them to divorce. The whole 
the whole uh, Nazi persecution was geared toward uh, getting these non-Jews to, uh, uh, to, to comply with Nazi wishes and, and regulations. And actually, uh, <clears throat> they, they realized that they were failing. Uh, and by 1938, especially following uh, the Kristallnacht, Hitler uh, secretly uh, made a decree dividing the intermarried couples the same way that the half Jews had been divided. And that is uh, some were privileged and some were not. The ones who were not privileged ended up having to wear the Star of David and thus being marked as criminals. Goebbels uh, talked about his reason for, uh, for introducing the star. And that was, uh, uh, that was uh, to uh, uh, mark them as criminals. And these were the people who were going to be removed day after day, at least week after week, month after month, the number of persons wearing that yellow patch uh, grew smaller. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but still the regime uh, put off deporting any of the intermarried Jews, including the non-privileged ones who wore the star. And, uh, uh, but uh, as uh, the end of 1942 drew to a close, and the, also the battle in the East drew to a close against the Soviet Union, Hitler, who had said that, uh, you know, we would put off uh, deportation of Jews in Berlin until after, or at least, you know, the, all of the last Jews, put that off until after the battle in the East, agreed with Goebbels on uh, December the 6th, I think it was, or the 8th of 1942, that all of the, uh, uh, the full Jews wearing the star would be deported. And then Goebbels writes on February the 18th, uh, 1943 in his diary that he's decided he's going to clean the table. He's going to get all the Jews out of Berlin so that he can finally declare Berlin free of Jews which other uh, regional leaders as he was had done in other sections of the, of the country. So uh, about that same time, the Jewish community was told to prepare for uh, deportations of huge dimensions. And, uh, and they began those deportations at the same time, en enormous amounts of surveying was going on across Germany to make sure that every Jew was accounted for uh, and that uh, even the churches were required to fill out forms uh, in Berlin uh, that detailed who was uh, Jewish and who was, uh, you know, a Christian of, of non-Aryan origins. That means a Jew who converted. So there was a very big effort to be totally thorough. And uh, uh, so in uh, my my, uh, my argument is that the regime was trying to deport as many of these intermarried Jews as possible. Certainly all of the intermarried Jews, the non-privileged Jews who wore the Star of David, uh, that's the regime's uh, replication of that, uh, were to be deported. Then uh, 2,000 of them were rounded up among some 10,000 uh, Berlin of the last Jews in Berlin in uh, February 27th and, a few, and some days after that. And uh, they were brought to this uh, building in the Rosenstrasse. I think that the intention was to uh, send them to work camps uh, because in Auschwitz, uh, they had just sent 6,000 Jews off because they were afraid the Jews were collaborating and conspiring and they needed to replace these. And in Auschwitz, uh, the economic SS was expecting 9,000 to 15,000 skilled Jewish workers from Berlin because uh, uh, Himmler and the SS had just been persuaded and some of the, uh, the firms in Germany uh, in the war industry had been convinced to move their factories to Auschwitz. So uh, we have a push from Berlin and Goebbels to uh, to clear Berlin of Jews, and we have a pool from Auschwitz for more laborers. And uh, it's not that any of these intermarried Jews were supposed to return. Of course, they were going to be put on a train and never seen again. 
if the uh, regime had its way, but they were uh, sorted out from the other uh, deportees uh, to be uh, uh, sorted out for labor and sent to Birkenau, the work camp in Auschwitz. And uh, that happened that uh, uh, these Jewish husbands, when they uh, did not return on the uh, evening of uh, February 27th, that was a Sabbath uh, in uh, Berlin, uh, everywhere, it's a Saturday, and uh, the, uh, the non-Jewish partners uh, quickly began to inquire what happened. Of course, these non-Jewish partners were very special, were, were just uh, always uh, looking out. And if there was anything unusual, they were going to be investigating it. And this was a signal that something had gone wrong. They hadn't heard from their partners and they didn't return. So uh, many of them went on in despair, not finding out, but some of them uh, immediately found out uh, that these Jewish partners of non-Jewish uh, women had been taken to a former, uh, to a actually an, an actual uh, Jewish community administration center in the heart of Berlin on Rosenstrasse. And so they went there and uh, <clears throat> I have uh, interviewed a woman who said that there that evening as they were, uh, some of them, of course, checked to see where their husbands were, were imprisoned, saying they had, that their husbands had the potato, potato ration cards or they had the house key and, uh, and there was communication. They found out, in fact, that their husbands were there and they uh, made a decision that they would come back early the next morning and make a scene. Uh, and of course, a scene in Nazi Germany was precisely uh, what the regime wanted to avoid, any kind of dissenting scene. Of course, it was strictly illegal for anybody to, uh, to, to move uh, collectively or aggregately without the Nazi party. And certainly not to openly challenge the Gestapo. Right. Well, exactly. And especially not on this issue, yeah. which was so fundamental to the Nazis and also uh, Goebbels had just given his infamous speech, Jew won total war on February the 18th. This is, uh, you know, 10 days before. And, uh, and, 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 and Goebbels and the Nazis, it becomes clear, see the elimination of Jews from the territory as an important part of uh, winning the total war because they always thought of the Jews as a fifth column, as people behind the curtains in whatever way they can, internationally and nationally, organizing to uh, dissent and defy and defeat the uh, Nazis. Right. So, uh, so you have uh, a lot of uh, reasons there for these uh, the anybody wearing the Star of David uh, uh, to be deported. And and uh, Goebbels in April uh, makes it clear that when he said he's going to clear uh, Berlin of Jews, Judenrein is the uh, German expression. Uh, it makes it clear in April when he said, there are still some people running around in Berlin wearing the yellow patch. And I can't have that and both declare <laughs> Berlin uh, free of Jews because people know that the yellow patch signifies Jews. Either I'm going to have to take the patch off or deport them. And it turns out he didn't deport the uh, intermarried uh, Berlin Jews. And at work, uh, these, uh, that is Jews who went out in public uh, to work, were told they could take this, that yellow patch off uh, by employers. And uh, so, so basically when, when Goebbels, of course, talked about making Berlin free of Jews, he was talking about getting rid of everybody in Berlin who wore that yellow patch, and certainly the people in Rosenstrasse did. Yeah, Nathan, I'm very curious about one thing. Where did the women who protested there, I think it's more than a week long protest, where a they basically, uh, it was a sit-in, right? Uh, and you have given a very beautiful description. Several women stood arm in arm in tight groups, you write in your introduction. Where did this courage come from? Because by then it was quite well established that being a, a German Aryan by itself was not a protection. After all, socialists and communists had been sent 
to the concentration camps long ago, even if they were fully racially, uh, uh, you know, unobjectionable, quote unquote. So where did you know, this courage a, come from? It's such a good question because obviously it doesn't just materialize. We, we are people who become what we practice. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I want to say right away that this is another element of the story that is critical. And that is that, um, uh, you know, racial defilement was a crime in Germany that earned at least uh, some, or, you know, the death penalty, at least it was prohibited on pain of, uh, of the death penalty. And that's what these uh, intermarried couples were living in, in racial defilement. And this racial defilement, according to Nazi ideology, was always most serious and most depraved and horrible when, when the, uh, the, the, the partner was a Jewish man, uh, because that was defiling the capacities of uh, non-Jewish, of, of Aryan women, German women, to bear uh, healthy, uh, it's impossible to uh, discuss Nazis without uh, using some of their concepts. And, you know, in order to explain uh, that this was, uh, and that's one of the reasons I believe that the regime was extra sensitive to any, any, any kind of uh, rumors or public uh, displays that brought attention to the fact that they were still intermarried couples in Germany. It, 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 it waited to get rid of them. It had planned to win the war in the East and then in that great jubilation of, of you know, grand uh, elevation of Hitler in opinion, they could uh, risk uh, taking uh, measures that they had hesitated to do before. Uh, uh, as strange as it may seem, uh, that is Hitler was very sensitive to, uh, to the uh, perception of his image, uh, because uh, this was the glue that held everything together. Even when the Nazis weren't party, uh, weren't popular, the party wasn't popular, Hitler remained very much uh, the center of consensus, such as it was. So, uh, uh, so Hitler was waiting until the grand uh, victory in the East, but he went ahead uh, without the victory. However, uh, you know, they were very sensitive to the possibility of protest on the 2nd of February, uh, Goebbels talks to the leader of the, the most elite SS unit, the Leibstandarte, the bodyguard of Hitler, the first unit of SS men, and, uh, and says he's going to bring them in in order to achieve his ends, which I, you know, and they, and they turned out uh, to be in the first two days arresting and brutalizing Jews on February 27th and 28th, members of Hitler's Leibstandarte. Uh, the SS, it never happened before or after, to my knowledge, that the SS uh, was arresting and brutalizing. And, and, and there were witnesses who say they saw, uh, they noticed their, uh, their, their insignia, their uniforms, uh, and, uh, and their medals of valor for what they had done in war in the East Front. So, uh, so, so Goebbels is trying to intimidate any kind of action by having the SS men. He's aware that it could lead to trouble. And the reason is that, uh, to get back to your question, is because these women had been practicing all along and being forced to take steps of non-compliance and protest day by day since the beginning of- Right, because the they were the, for example, they had refused to divorce their uh, their Jewish partners. So that would be one, one aspect of it. Am I right? Yes, yes, exactly. They refused to divorce. I think that's the, the, we know that that's the linchpin because the Gestapo had a policy where as soon as a, a non-Jewish partner in these intermarriages would agree to divorce, they would deport the Jew. Or as soon as the non-Jewish partner died, they would deport the Jew from that marriage. So we know this is like, as one of the people told me, it was a silk thread that Jewish lies were hanging by. And she was uh, so aware of her role there. This was Elsa Holzer. And, and, and at one point, her family uh, exiled her and told her never to come back. 
and uh, and so these were extremely uh, lonely people. If you read about theories of resistance, I think a good one is that uh, everybody who's in the front lines of resistance needs some sort of backup. People who aren't on the front lines but willing to uh, give them some sort of encouragement, whether you know material or psychological. And uh, so uh, I'm not aware that these poor people had a lot of that, except for their partners. They had each other. And yeah. uh, it wasn't only divorce. You know, there were various uh, examples of things along the way where uh, the intermarried uh, non-Germans did, uh, did not comply. For example, I'm thinking about a major in uh, early 1940s where Jews were prohibited from buying any uh, non-Jewish newspapers. And uh, the post office was in charge of uh, enforcing this. We have these uh, correspondence in the archives where the post office says, we can't tell whether a Jew is intermarried or not. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, the non-Jewish partners uh, were supplying them with newspapers and, and uh, uh, they, they had to abandon that, uh, that, ex, uh, that measure. Right. Nathan, it just occurred to me, uh, again, uh, because I, I'm very struck by that image you have described of the women standing in tight, uh, you know, linked arms. Could it be that the act of gathering there, though they may have known that there were many others like them, was it that the... I think finally it was a few thousand women. Well, uh, this that is the unknown. physical, the unity of standing yeah. there together uh, was that what you know may have also bolstered their courage, uh, because uh, yeah. they. I don't think they could have felt that there was no chance that they would be shot at. I think there was. That's very clear that there was a very real possibility that the Gestapo would just gun them down. Exactly. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's first of all something that I talked about with them and, and that they brought up uh, uh, independently was that they were not aware of each other. There was not a big network of intermarried uh, non-Jews in these uh, intermarriages. There was some, uh, but uh, on the whole, they met each other on the street and they, they described how this sense of solidarity began to develop as they you know, faced the Gestapo. Now, normally you would fear uh, entrusting anybody with your secret, but everybody on the street was clearly an ally yeah. willing to face it. And they talked about how the uh, solidarity uh, developed. And then uh, one Elsa Holzer talked about how at first they didn't at first, she didn't think that this was going to necessarily be successful, but they had to take action. She emphasized that they acted from the heart. If they had sat around discussing what to do, they wouldn't have done this, but uh, acted Beautiful. from the heart. And then they changed the context. They changed the conversation. All other forms of resistance that I know of were for conspiratorial, you know, popping up and destroying, which is also, of course, heroic and valid. But this was a form of, of conversing with the Gestapo. And one of the reasons it was successful was precisely because the regime knew exactly who these women were and, and knew what they were willing to put on the line. And essentially that from the beginning, they had paired themselves with their Jewish partners and with their fate. And uh, I will add that uh, <clears throat> by this time in the war after after so much uh, hardship and uh, and decision to put oneself on the line that the conditions of war and of these uh, you know years of uh, of deprivation had also trained them to put their lives on the line not just to dissent but there was also some uh, desperation of course but there was this need to take action yeah yeah. And yet, as you noted, it could easily have gone wrong, right? There was uh, that only under certain circumstances could the Gestapo be effectively challenged. So what saved? What, what led to the triumph of the Rosenstrasse protesters? 
uh, what stopped the Gestapo from killing them all? I think it was probably above all uh, Goebbels, who was the regional director for, for Greater Berlin. Uh, there was also the fact that this was just not the way the Nazis operated, that uh, shooting uh, non-Jews on the street or even Jews on the street was not something that they did. I mean, they even uh, tried uh, at least, you know, that was the wish to de deport and, and, and take Jews through the streets of the city at night so people didn't see it and to uh, deport them family by family so there weren't family members left behind making inquiries. So they wanted to do this in secret. And uh, <clears throat> that, that has something to do with the power of protest too. The fact that uh, protest is so difficult and so dangerous pairs with the fact that it's especially uh, threatening to this dictatorship that wished to preserve its image, especially the one of uh, there's no dissent and especially the one uh, that uh, has just declared total war and total war depends on <laughs> increased activity and energy from the people. Nothing else is there. I mean, Hitler keeps talking about a, a miracle weapon that doesn't occur, but it's basically the people who will have to do more for total war. And so there was this uh, concern at the time, uh, not only following the defeat at Stalingrad, but also uh, the Americans and the British had just begun to bomb in tandem, one at day and one at night. And uh, Berlin was really beginning to feel the pain of, of bombing. And, 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 and that comes on in Goebbels' diary perhaps more than uh, of a concern of his than, than Stalingrad, but certainly they're both important in terms of the context that uh, the, uh, and then another major context here is that before, whenever the Nazis had made regulations and the intermarried couples had ignored them, defied them, or just uh, went around them, they always made exceptions. And that's exactly why Hitler had made this uh, two categories of uh, intermarried Jews in December 1938, because he's trying to minimize the number of, of, of people at first to see whether uh, how much trouble that makes of intermarried Jews deporting them and uh, uh, so they're proceeding uh, step by step here and uh, they make one more exception. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, they've made these exceptions before including the one I just talked about with newspapers and uh, they've been trying to intimidate them into, uh, into compliance. They also, of course, always used uh, whether false or real a sort of uh, cajoling. One uh, man told me his mother was promised that he, as a half Jew marked with the Star of David, uh, would have to would go to a military school and become an officer. This was a promise to his mother if she only divorced. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so they were going on both sides. They were being called into the Gestapo. I, the women that I talked to, uh, you know, had harrowing stories of being called into. Uh, the Gestapo to be sort of ridiculed and humiliated and threatened and uh, cajoled. Uh, so they were, uh, they, you know, they were trying to get them to, they were trying to intimidate them into separation. And, and this arrest combined with the SS in the whole brutal context of a, a, a roundup and deportation was supposed to intimidate. It was a raised level of intimidation but the women in, 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 in uh, response raised their own level of non-compliance through a street protest, which they hadn't done before. Hmm. Yeah, but finally they did succeed. That particular protest succeeded succeed. and all the men were released, am I right? Yes, all the men were released. Uh, you know, uh, there, uh, exactly, to my knowledge, of course, there were some, there were two or three uh, intermarried Jews who were called intellectuals, who the Gestapo did deport, because intellectuals were especially dangerous, and possible forming opinions uh, for others. 
Uh, so it could have turned out differently, as you mentioned. Uh, of course, even a trigger happy uh, Gestapo man. There, there were some who felt totally, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> entitled, yeah. or maybe even mandated. Yeah. to shoot in such an occasion. And the other thing that this did, which is so critical for understanding its power, is that it divided the Nazis about what to do. Uh, uh, on the one hand, you had some saying, of course, we're just you know, we're going to arrest them. They wouldn't have shot them. They would have uh, arrested them, <clears throat> deported during the night, tried to dissipate the scene. Um, but uh, they, they were, uh, and, and, you know, so it divided them. And that's the thing about uh, public action that, uh, uh, you know, where they're communicating. Uh, it divides the, uh, the regime. Some see their self uh, interest over here on this side. Goebbels, may, Goebbels was a minister of propaganda who always wanted to do things with his methods of psychological manipulation. Himmler had the weapons. Goebbels had to show that he could do it in a more sophisticated way. Um, and so there was the Goebbels side, and then there was, uh, and, and, and the Hitler side, Hitler side, but you know, there were people who didn't understand that Hitler had to maintain his uh, image. Uh, in the Gestapo, uh, just wanted to use brute force to get everything done. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, went on as a dispute about what to do. And we know this from a driver uh, who gave testimony in court about these disputes he heard about, uh, rivaling factions, he called them, uh, about what to do. And then and Goebbels, who was away, uh, arrived back in town. And, and according to his deputy, who I interviewed, he immediately uh, said, you know, we're going to, in order to get rid of the protest, we're going to release the reason for the protest. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, I think the most haunting uh, description of that period is uh, from Hannah Arendt, right? The banality of evil. <clears throat> and uh, there are many people I've spoken to in this series who, while they are drawn to nonviolence, do also say that, oh, it could never have worked against the Nazis or a Nazi-like force. Uh, that is namely people... Uh, either individuals or an entire collective with power behind it, that lacks conscience completely. Uh, so in light of, I mean, these you're familiar with this whole um, line of reasoning. Yeah. Does the example, does the success of Rosenstrasse give us a glimmer of light to counter? Well, we know that uh, China has recently crushed these incredibly brave and persistent uh, protesters in Hong Kong. It's not to, uh, uh, to take any lessons outside of this context. And, uh, and I do want to emphasize and emphasize again, this has nothing to do with conscience or morality. This has to do with the cold calculation that the Nazis made about uh, how they could achieve their ends. And uh, that, uh, uh, those ends uh, included uh, primarily, most of all at this point, winning the war. And so uh, we'll take uh, conscience totally out of the picture. And Gandhi, too, was a strategist. Um, I finally began to study him more in, uh, in graduate school. And, uh, you know, he's talking about uh, uh, how to be influential, how to be powerful, uh, certainly uh, coercive in that sense. Uh, so that uh, so that uh, we're not dependent on on conscience, and uh, the Nazis certainly did not have that. Certainly, Hitler did not have that. He had it. He had a conscience that told him he should uh, proceed and according to his thinking and achieve national socialism, the dominance of Germany in the continent and then the world. That was his conscience. Uh, so uh, it had nothing to do with uh, human life as value, but. Uh, but uh, it, this always had to do with uh, ideas of tactics and overall goals and the, that Hitler and the Nazis were, Hitler especially, I'm thinking of, and he's made one making decisions here ultimately, is willing to move laterally before moving ahead. In other words, he, you know, that uh, World War I a metaphor of, you know, one trench hitting another trench 
was showed to stalemate, and then the, the Germans had the Blitzkrieg, where they, uh, you know, the, the, the strategicians uh, went around rather than a frontal, and so this remained part of uh, of, of Nazi thinking, even though uh, Hitler was incapable of retreating at Stalingrad. Uh, he did retreat at home, uh, occasionally tried to avoid any, any, any protests for sure by not, uh, by not running in traditions. And I wanted to make that point too. When we talk about nonviolence, we're talking about the Nazi incursion on, on the private sphere, on, uh, on family, on religion, and where people responded out of a sense that they really had the right to do this. That, that this was the way they did things. And they had, so they had a sense of, uh, of righteousness about it as well. And as of asserting a, it, of a, actively asserting it. You know, you're actively asserting it. That's a good point. Actively asserting it, actively asserting it. They felt that strongly that they, uh, they took action. And I, there's, but there's no protest that's more, uh, more remarkable than the one on Rosenstrasse because uh, uh, they were uh, they didn't think Hitler was on their side yeah. as some people apparently did when they were dissenting they knew that he wasn't they uh, they were acting on this uh, racial aspect even in total war and when uh, the regime was resolved to make uh, all of you know in 1942 in November Hitler or uh, Himmler ordered that. Uh, even the Reich territory would be made free of Jews, even, even in the concentration camps and, and the camps and prisons, every Jew would be moved from German territory. And this, uh, the Gestapo knew this uh, February the 27th uh, uh, roundup and deportation effort as the removal of all Germans from, uh, all Jews from German territory action. In other words, this was, uh, this was the, the effort to get all the last Jews from Berlin. Yeah. You know, you've quoted, um, you've quoted Vaclav Havel at the beginning of your book, uh, where he says, human uniqueness, human action, and human spirit must be rehabilitated. I was wondering if there are any particular quotations from your interviews with the Rosenstrasse survivors and protesters that you would like to perhaps share here as an inspiration. Well, I would, and some of them accompany me, and that's the something I could never have expected. That you know, because I, I wanted uh, I wanted information, and I got things I couldn't ask. I didn't know how to ask for. That is things that stick with me. Um, um, <clears throat> and of course, Václav Havel. I wanted to say that uh, it's his uh, the attempt to live in the truth, which I think illustrates and uh, the model of resistance here. And 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 so many of us uh, studying uh, German history and looking for resistance have used other definitions uh, that don't integrate the day by day stand, uh, integrate resistance into the daily life. And that's what these women did I find is so important and, and shows civil courage, shows real civil courage because it was on display, it was public too. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I think of Elsa Holzer who was one of the most uh, thoughtful people and whose husband died not long after the Third Reich, tragically, but uh, she, first of all, she said, you know, we acted from the heart. We, we did what we, uh, what we were compelled to do. And I think uh, certainly you can find in Havel also, certainly Titnat Han, uh, the idea is that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, you have to act not only from the head, or maybe certainly not let the head lead. Uh, if you're uh, taking action, uh, for him it was uh, perhaps uh, morally as well as strategically. Uh, that's what they did, and she said you have to act, for, and you see what happened. And she also said that you'll never know how much strength you have until you're in a position where you really have to just. A hope for strength of grace, I guess, that you have everything on the line and that you know it's not 
you know that uh, you 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 can't force it. Uh, you you might fail. Um, of course, Elsa Holzer is the one who also mentioned that after the war, uh, every time she brought up the fact that her father had exiled her, her sisters, I think she had three of them, would say, oh, Elsa, stop talking bad about our poppy. Uh, you know, they wouldn't let her talk about her experience. She also talked about women who had actually spit on her during the Third Reich, who came up as soon as the Third Reich had collapsed and wanted to hug her and say, oh, Elsa, how are you today? Uh, you know, uh, so these, on both sides of uh, human activity, she, she illustrated uh, and was aware. And uh, another thing I can't forget that she says, you know, people can get along, but wait until there's uh, not enough to go around and then they might wring your neck. So Elsa Holzer, and there were others too, but that comes to mind. Uh, there was one who said that she was aware of Gandhi. Mm. Uh, that was nice. Uh, and of course that was in the news, in the German news too, uh, at the time the, uh, the Gandhian uh, resistance to British imperialism. That's actually the first reference I've heard to Gandhi in the connection uh, in relation to Rosenstrass. I've never otherwise I've seen any reference connecting it uh, to Gandhi. Is that the lone one that even you could find? It's the lone one. I didn't always ask that. Um, and so many years later, they might not have uh, responded to that. And of course, I was careful to listen as much as possible because questions might put things in their memories that might not have otherwise come up. It certainly, uh, these people had a lot of integrity. That's the thing, I, you know, uh, people say you can't do oral history and memories are not reliable, but also it depends on, on you know, what is, uh, you know, who is talking and what is yeah. their uh, record of, of living in the truth, let alone yeah. speaking the truth. So yeah. um, uh, that's um, <clears throat> something I wanted to say as well. Sure. So Nathan, kind of in closing, um, how how does nonviolence going forward look to you? I mean, as a way of life, as a form of protest, uh, we live in a world now. Uh, what is it? It's going to be eighty years next year since that uh, incident, which you have uh, so uh, carefully documented, uh, and democracies across the world are are looking in peril. So. Um, as somebody who has walked this path for so long, is there any advice that you would share with young people who are drawn to nonviolence and yet they do sometimes feel daunted? Well, absolutely. First of all, it's a choice. It remains a choice and it can be a choice just based on uh, preference. Uh, one rare student in my class once said that he would rather be killed than to kill somebody. Whereas uh, mostly uh, the ethics of my students uh, seem to be uh, self-survival, you know, is, is perhaps the highest ethic. But uh, so, so that we have to take all this into account. And then strategically, I, you know, these, these protesters so brave in Myanmar and Hong Kong and other places don't have allies. Not only that, but their, their, their opposition has stronger allies. China, because of its economic power, Myanmar because of businesses that were earning profits. Uh, these, everybody needs allies and, uh, and, and, and protesters <clears throat> do as well. Of course, the theory is absolutely sound that enough, if enough people uh, non-comply, any, any government, including dictators will have no power. Uh, that was illustrated by an attempted military coup in Germany in 1920, the Kaputsch, Putsch, where, uh, you know, the army uh, didn't have anybody to tell what to do because everybody was on a general strike. Uh, but uh, you just don't have, you know, there's so many ways and reasons that people uh, don't all non-comply in sufficient numbers to bring down a government. Uh, and uh, so, so we need uh, allies. I would, uh, 
I would say that protest still remains the uh, strongest uh, force for challenging authoritarian governments who are so concerned with controlling the media and images because they rule by images. They rule not by uh, talking about uh, policies. Of course, they have uh, policies that could be popular as long as they're supplying the people with security and economic wealth. Often that's enough uh, for people to go along. Uh, but um, certainly I think, uh, and, and it's so, uh, it's it, it's so encouraging that uh, you know if you go into the halls of power, often you find it full of men. But if you go into protest, you find a lot of women and also women in leadership. And so everybody, and that was the whole point of the suffrage movement, of course, yes. that the women were being ignored, so they had to take their protest to where their presence and their desire to where it couldn't be ignored. A protest is 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 gaining in significance, not, not retreating. And you know, already in 2020, I think Time Magazine, various publications were calling 2020 the year of protest. Of course, 2021 was even uh, more the year of protest with Black Lives Matters. And there's just an escalation of the realization that uh, people have a voice and that democracy is not only uh, counting uh, whether you have a ballot box, but on whether your voice will be heard. And sometimes that voice has to be heard in unison, in chorus, uh, you know, crowds of people with one message on the street. Thank you so much. You're Is so there welcome. anything anything that we, you would like to add before we close? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but that I enjoyed this very much. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm so glad to be part of the HIMSA uh, conversation.